What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with another podcast, What's Going On in Pop Culture Right Now. Got a short but sweet pod this week talking Beyonce's new album, Cowboy Carter, new K-pop from Baby Monster and Tomorrow Together, and also the new blockbuster film, Godzilla Kong, The New Empire. So make sure you subscribe, youtube.com slash nostalgiapod, linktree.com slash nostalgiapod, see the links below, get the pod any way you can, leave a review, do all the things, get the Spotify playlist also linked below, and yeah, let me know it's good let's get into it what's up welcome back to nostalgia dave here with a review of baby monsters debut mini album baby monster baby monster you know them at this point the first yg entertainment girl group to debut since blackpink way back in 2016 obviously that kind of status that kind of mantle placed upon a new group at yg was going to get a lot of attention and their debut single from last year batter up Certainly got a lot of eyeballs, certainly got a lot of listens, and it got a lot of criticism because Baby Monster's debut single, unfortunately, came across as very backward looking and kind of creatively uninspired on the part of YG. And it's disappointing because I think the the Baby Monster group, these seven very young women, they're all still teenagers, the seven members in Baby Monster come across as quite talented. I think there's some engaging rap talent, hip-hop talent on here, which you know you need if you're in a YG group, of course. And I've enjoyed the singing that we've got so far. And it's just a bit frustrating that this group feels like they're being held back by their label's kind of creative malaise. Baby Monster's debut mini album is a step in the right direction following the lead single, Batter Up. But ultimately, it still leaves you feeling like Baby Monster don't really have a sonic identity. And the problem is not with the members of Baby Monster. These seven young women come across as quite talented. I do enjoy the vocals. I enjoy the rapping a lot. But unfortunately, YG is so uninspired musically, especially on the production side of things, that they continue to look backwards when their contemporaries over at Hive are definitely looking forwards from a sonic perspective. Making songs that so overtly mimic Blackpink songs from production sound, production structure, general song idea, like it's just really unfortunate that the Baby Monster women are kind of stuck with this because YG is just not really helping them. The best moment on this debut album is when Baby Monster is actually given the opportunity to sound a little bit different. And that, of course, would be on the B-side like that, which, you know, the snares and the whistle sound great, but just a different vibe right off the bat and has an amazing hook. I think it's a very catchy song. Clear highlight on this project. Very strong rap as well. That's what I want from this group because it's still feels like a YG song, but that one, I feel like that one's a little bit unique. If Baby Monster can lean into that mix of singing and, and hip-hop, that that could be a path forward. Because a song like Sheesh, which is the, you know, the, the next single for this group here, which has the music video out now, Sheesh is a lot like Batter Up in the sense that it feels like a facsimile of a Blackpink song. And not that there's not some fun qualities to it. There's a reason why G keeps going back to this well and making this kind of song again. You know, I think the rap goes hard. Baby Monster, three different rappers. You know, that's fun. But it's just kind of repetitive, the sheesh, over and over again. You know, that being said, the other part of the chorus, the B-A-B-Y-M-O-N part, kind of sticky. I, I do like that. But it, this, again, like speaking to the repetitiveness of YG's single sounds, sheesh has... This outro where they whisper and they go into a ch- chant and it, it's so reminiscent of all the other outros on the YG bangers, you know, <laughs> and again, it's just un- unfortunate that I keep sticking onto this thing, but it's just this is what the music makes me think of right away. And this should be more of a celebration of the group. You know, Ahian is back with the group, the seventh member they released on this, uh, you know, Baby Monster album. Stuck in the Middle, the second single, re-recorded with all seven members, as well as Batter Up, re-recorded with all seven members. This should be more of a celebration, and I think if they kind of leaned into like that, maybe you made that the next single with the video, it would have kind of put more of a best foot forward. Uh, I do enjoy the Stuck in the Middle remix a lot more than the original. Stuck in the Middle as the second Baby Monster single, it's just kind of a generic piano ballad. There's not a whole lot more to it, to be honest. It's It's okay. Uh, the vocals aren't anything special. Uh, you know, I guess the bass kind of bounces on the chorus. But when you get the the remix, it's super up-tempo, super synthy. And then when you get the chorus, it's basically a house song. Um, it definitely livens up 
you know, your, your traditional piano ballad. The song Dream is another ballad, and I think this one at least is more enjoyable than Stuck in the Middle's normal ballad version because there's more of an orchestral build. It just sounds a bit better. I also really like the vocals on the intro, which is obviously a short intro song, but the harmony along with those, those horns, those high notes, I thought the singing sounded really good. These members are talented. They just need to be given and supported properly. And it's a competitive space right now, uh, this K-pop fourth generation. You know, it's, the female groups are certainly dominating, right? But when you think about groups like IVE or New Jeans or La Seraphim or Espa, no matter how you feel about all those groups, what they sound like, what they're doing is at least different, at least leaning into other things. Baby Monster can't afford to make 2017 K-pop music, you know? And there's more groups coming, including at YG, the black label, the sub-label of YG from Teddy Park. They're debuting a group too. So Baby Monster's going to have a lot of competition. You know, you had uh, the, the new group that just came out in Hypen's label like last month. It, it, it's a busy, competitive field. And Baby Monster's getting a lot of attention because they're on one of those big four labels and all the black pink comparisons, fair or not, are going to be there. But the music needs to be there too. And I think apart from a song like like that, it's just a lot of moments. It's a lot of ideas. It's a lot of concepts. And I think this group is talented enough from what I've heard vocally. Again, what I've heard hip hop wise, I think they're giving you some of the best rapping you get from you know the young generation for sure. They just need better songs. And hopefully we can get that. And hopefully YG can understand and realize and mea culpa and see this. So I'm certainly very interested in what this other black label group under YG sounds like. And if they sound any different, you know, Teddy Park also hasn't exactly dodged the washed allegations based off his production on the last Blackpink album. So, you know, we'll see. But let me know. How did you feel about Baby Monster's debut album? Did you think it was a slight step in the right direction thanks to the strength of Like That the way I do? Were you just kind of a bit let down the way Batter Up went? How are you feeling about this group in general? Let me know. And for more K-pop reviews, more music reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Tomorrow Together's latest mini-album slash EP, Minisode 3, Tomorrow. TXT, you know them at this point, five years in the game. They become one of the most commercially successful and just consistently popular K-pop boy groups of the last handful of years look no further than the fact that they're going on yet another worldwide arena tour, Act Promise Tour, performing at Madison Square Garden later this year. They've truly gotten out of the shadow of BTS as, you know, high label mates and have become just, I think, one of the most dominant and consistent male groups. Whether they're at the absolute top during this BTS hiatus, not entirely sure. They might be, though, and Hypen's up there, too, but TXT, I mean, they're certified at this point. They are very big. And, you know, Minisode 3 tomorrow, I'm not super big on the TXT lore. I know these EP releases are a bit more evergreen. But this project, seven songs, 17 minutes, really five songs because one of them is an interlude and the title is just Morse Code of TXT. Cool Easter egg there. And then another song is just a remix of the lead single Deja Vu. So really it's five songs. I thought TXT's new mini album minisode three tomorrow was pretty strong for a tight succinct listen as most eps would be this one has a lot of i think great songs to revisit the very first song i'll see you tomorrow immediately grabs you with that kick drum very high tempo and this smooth singing from the txt guys really hits you and of course the lead single deja vu i thought was very catchy big guitar and drum outro towards the end I love the back and forth vocals with the singing. You know, I think the production's not quite as strong. I don't think the production on Deja Vu is quite as strong as it is on I'll See You There Tomorrow, but I still like the song quite a bit. Miracle, I think this one really stands out with a fun chorus, very pulsing drums. I enjoy this one quite a bit. Quarter Life made me laugh because you have these guys so successful, so popular, so established in their field at this point. Talking about a quarter life crisis, a bit, a bit amusing. Uh, to me. On top of that, the song kind of builds up to, I think, the weakest chorus on the EP, just kind of a shout chant type thing. It's pretty repetitive. If anything, like, Quarter Life Crisis, I feel like male K-pop idols, they could talk about, like, the military service, and that being what gives them the angst about having a Quarter Life Crisis, 
while being millionaires, but they don't really get into that on this. But yeah, overall, Minisode 3 tomorrow, I think it's pretty pretty, pretty solid, pretty, pretty cool. If you're a TXT fan, this will certainly keep you going. Of course, not that they give you much room to worry about that sort of thing. They release a lot of music every year, usually multiple projects every year over these past five years. And of course, they're going on tour later this year. So it's certainly not a significant work from TXT. Of course, it's not as vast as one of their albums, obviously. But for one of these small interstitial releases, I think there's a handful of songs to revisit that are worth enjoying, such as I'll See You There Tomorrow, Deja Vu, and Miracle. So yeah, TXT, let me know how you feeling about them. Are you excited to see them on tour? What was your favorite song off Minisode 3 tomorrow? And for more K-pop reviews, more music reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Godzilla, Kong, The New Empire, the fifth film in Legendary's Monsterverse, directed by Adam Wingard, who also, of course, created 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. And we've been getting a lot of Godzilla, we've been getting a lot of Monsterverse lately, because last year, 2023, featured Toho's Godzilla Minus One, which won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects, and is celebrated as perhaps the greatest kaiju film of all time. For me personally, it certainly uh, is the greatest kaiju film I've ever seen. Absolutely over the moon for that movie, did a full review on that, check that out if you missed it. And we also, of course, got... On Apple TV Plus, Monarch Legacy of Monsters, the first TV show in the uh, Monsterverse. And that's a show that I also reviewed in full that I liked, you know, a fair amount. I thought it was pretty solid. And that was a prequel show set way back in the continuity of these films. And now we have Godzilla Kong the New Empire coming out at kind of an unfortunate time due to that proximity to Minus One. Because Minus One was so strong and so widely recognized and frankly successful like few Japanese movies can be in the U.S. at the box office as well. So, not that there was a lot of pressure on Godzilla Kong the New Empire. You see the box office is doing very, very well. you have happy the franchise is still very successful, the Hollywood version of Godzilla. But, you know, to me, Godzilla Kong the New Empire, it's just a bit weaker than I wanted it to be. And I think the biggest sin with this movie, which I enjoyed for what it is, it's a fun time. But unfortunately, it almost doesn't take anything seriously at this point. And when you combine that with the fact that the human characters that are in the film are so weak, so forgettable, so lacking in characterization and personality and anything to really do from a plot perspective, this movie, you know, it just kind of feels like a lesser version of its predecessor, Godzilla vs. Kong from 2021, which already felt like, you know, the series had kind of strayed away from, to me, it's amazing beginnings with 2014 Godzilla from Gareth Edwards. There is fun stuff here, but ultimately, I don't know if any of the set pieces are particularly engaging or memorable. Frankly, some of the blocking and the just the visual presentation of the set pieces, which of course are completely animated, it, it doesn't stand out as that cool. And frankly, the Hollow Earth aspect, which of course we you know began in the previous films. We've since jumped the shark with this from a sci-fi and like believability standpoint. That's not a problem for me, but I just wish it was a bit more engaging. Like our our big bad guy here, this evil Kong, effectively, nothing that c- cool about him. He's kind of one note, and you know it's really a Kong movie first, which I don't have a problem with. But Godzilla, I don't know, he's kind of middling in the film you kind of want more from Godzilla who I think is the more popular character overall right but Godzilla doesn't get to do a whole lot and when he does have these kaiju fights around the world they're short and some of them are kind of visually indistinguishable it's just a bit a bit lacking to me I'm not even trying to engage with the human characters at all you have Rebecca Hall and Brian Terry Henry back from the previous film it doesn't really matter like I'm not I'm not even worried about that I, I think Dan Stevens is having a good time as a newcomer, very Ace Ventura y as it's been compared to, and the, the humor, the comic relief is fun. I just wish that like comedic and light tone that these movies bring you as this this ridiculous, you know, action that you get. I just wish there was a bit more weight to the plot. Like when we have these world conquering heroes or characters, you know, Godzilla ostensibly a good guy in this movie, still slaughtering people inadvertently even though he's not attempting to whenever he does anything in a city right and the movie kind of like shies away from that there's just no like depth or weight to anything that really happens in the film 
you know, I mean, and the whole stuff with Rebecca Hall's adoptive daughter from the previous film and the, the this lost tri- indigenous tribe of people from Skull Island and from the Hollow Earth, like, all of that is also super half-baked to me. Like, it doesn't really land and you just get a lot of exposition out of that stuff, to be honest. So you just kind of have to go for the ride and just be with what you're seeing on the set piece front. But unfortunately, I just don't think the set pieces are that great. Like nothing compares to the Mecha Godzilla fight from Godzilla vs. Kong. Godzilla King of Monsters from 2019, a movie I really disliked, honestly. But even like the fight with King Ghidorah was pretty memorable in that. You know, I just, Kong Skull Island, I think the zaniness of it has a bit more personality than just the general lightness that you get with the new empire. So I'm kind of of two minds where I'm very okay to just turn my brain off and be like, Hey, this is not going to be like minus one. It's going to be pretty sci-fi CGI fuck fest. Just go with it. Have a good time. But much like how transformers movies function, if the animated stuff doesn't really land for you, it's not being done high enough level. It's not pre vised effectively enough. I don't know how to put it, but like if those action set, set pieces aren't hitting for you, not standing out enough for you, there's not a lot to latch on to because there's just no character anywhere. I, of course, would love this franchise to continue, and I expect it will off the success of this film at the box office. I hope the success of this film, frankly, propels Legendary to pay for another season of Monarch. Maybe we can move that series up. It was serving as a sequel to Godzilla 2014, thus taking place before King of Monsters, before the, this world in the Monsterverse was so uh, open, where just the presence of Titans, the presence of Monarch, was public knowledge worldwide. It's probably more expensive to move that show up, though, where you have more more CGI, more Titans and stuff. I don't know. I would like that show to continue. Uh, I thought it was pretty fun. And I would like this series to continue as well. I enjoy I enjoy it. You know, I just... I'm not sure where where the Kong character should go. You know, like the whole stuff with like the baby Kong, the young Kong and the other Kongs that he discovers in the hollow earth. I wish it landed for me more than it did. I think the hollow earth stuff is completely untapped potential with this franchise. And frankly, we haven't got anything too cool with it yet, but it's also kind of endlessly open. If you just can conceive something more engaging overall, I feel like I'm coming across as very negative for a film that I broadly had a good time watching the entire time. I'm really just kind of comparing it to its past success as a franchise and just hoping for more, to be honest. So I think I would just like a little bit more tonal balance uh, in this franchise and just a higher degree of uh, set piece, you know, intrigue, I guess you could say. But yeah, Godzilla Khan, New Empire, to me, it's a step down from recent entries. And of course, there's no comparison to Godzilla Minus One, obviously. But for what it is, it's still kind of uh, turning your brain off laughing laugh, la- laughingly ridiculous good time so for that uh, there's something i think for for a lot of people here but if you're looking for some depth you're not going to find a lot of it with this one but yeah let me know how did you feel about godzilla kong the new empire did you like it more than me please let me know if you did why and for more movie reviews subscribe and i'll see you next time what's up welcome back nostalgia dave here with a review of beyonce's eighth album cowboy carter this is act two technically Beyonce's follow-up to Renaissance, her last album, Act 1, from 2022. Of course, Renaissance, an absolutely spectacular record, my number one album of 2022. Album that completely blew me away as this love letter to club music and club culture. And because it's Beyonce, because she's so great, it's done with such a uh, at such a high level, such uh, deep respect, deep knowledge. There's so much to glean and take away from an album like that, which I found uh, eminently revisitable. Beyonce kind of surprised me with the announcement of Cowboy Carter as Beyonce's ostensible country album. I liked Renaissance so much for being dancey and clubby, and I'm not the biggest country guy, so I was like, huh, I kind of wish Act 2 was more like Act 1. But, you know, thinking about this a little bit more... Beyonce is aging like a fine wine, which should come as no surprise. Her eighth album, Cowboy Carter, just shows that Beyonce can flex on us by doing whatever genre she wants, apparently. Renaissance being this love letter to club music, and now Cowboy Carter not just being a country album, but Beyonce bringing country into her next album, and also giving us a lot of folk, a lot of Americana. There's so much genre 
experiment and genre flair. This is a big album. It's a long album. I'd say it's probably too long. There was some stuff you could cut. There's some short songs, some interludes. There's a lot here. The reason there's a lot here is because Beyonce really wanted to make good on the promise of Daddy Lessons back on Lemonade in 2016, a long time ago at this point. And she's done that with, I think, a really impressive album. Once again, the song Bodyguard. God damn, is that a banger. That is Cuff It 2.0. Just calling it right now. That is a smash. Thinking about how this album was announced, it's actually kind of impressive too. You had the dueling lead singles, Texas Hold'em and 16 Carriages. And Texas Hold'em goes number one on the Billboard country charts, Beyonce being the first black woman to do just that. It also goes number one on the Hot 100 as well. Just kind of going through the track list here. Again, it's a long track list. There's a lot of songs here. Ultimately, I think it's a little too long, as I said, there's some stuff you could have cut, but I feel like I'm able, I'm willing to give Beyonce a bit more of a pass for the bloat here because this feels like probably her only time doing this genre, so she probably just kind of wanted to get all this out. If this was more pop-leaning, more R&B-leaning, more traditional Beyonce music, I would probably be more critical at the lack of curation, but I understand where it's coming from with this. Overall, though, I do think that Renaissance is a stronger album, which I don't think is much of a hot take at all. You know, we've kind of swapped out the club renaissance uh, motif this time for uh, Texas country or country radio Texas. You have some uh, like, you know, radio spots from Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson, of course, big cosigns in the country space. I think the album starts off very impressively with track one, American Requiem, just big guitar, uh, tambourine starts hitting like that song really goes uh, it's a lot of co- a lot of covers on this. You got Blackbird, of course, the Beatles song. You have Jolene, Dolly Parton's uh, famously covered at nauseum song. Dolly herself had asked Beyonce to cover this song for many years. She does it. It's not just a cover. It's more of a spin, a redo. Uh, of course, lyrics, there's a lot of change here. Feels like a Beyonce joint for sure. Uh, 16 Carriages, one of the lead singles. I like that song. I think I like it a little bit more in Texas Hold'em, which is... Definitely more uh, engaging, you know, with the banjo, but 16 characters to me, I, I just kind of love the way the, the drum hits, the claps. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, My Rose, a short song, but catchy. I think the singing is just really lovely from Beyonce on that. I love the quick cadence uh, as well. As I said, Bodyguard is a certified banger. I love the tempo. I just think it's an epic song. The guitar breakdown at the end. I listened to this song like four times in a row after I heard it for the first time. Like, just an absolute stunner to me. It, to me, it's the best song on the album. But there's certainly some other contenders, which, again, speaks to the strength of this record. Uh, Daughter, I like that one. I thought Spaghetti stood out, just because you have Beyonce giving you bars. Very aggressive, very stark switch up. You know, just wondering what Act 3 from Beyonce would be. Wouldn't be opposed to Beyonce's hip-hop album. You know, she dabbled with it with the Carter's album with Jay-Z, of course, but a full-fledged Beyonce hip-hop album, I'd be down. I thought Algar Tears was pretty solid. Uh, Just for Fun, this duet with Willie Jones, really great. I think the choir, you know, the claps, like uh, the call and response elements to that, I think that song is very engaging, very catchy for sure. Uh, and then we got perhaps the most high-profile duet here, which would be Two Most Wanted, featuring Miley Cyrus. Miley just has a rasp, as we know, to her vocals. Really fits on a song like this. And her and Beyonce going back and forth, basically going bar for bar. And then when they harmonize, it's epic. I think this kind of completes the best stretch of the album. Again, it's a long album, so you got to have a favorite section, right? But we have Bodyguard, the Jolene cover, Daughter, Spaghetti, I'll Get Your Tears, Just For Fun, and Two Most Wanted. That is a very strong stretch on this album. Right after that, you have Levi's Jeans featuring Post Malone. I'm not normally a Post Malone guy, but you understand why he would be on a song like this. And frankly, and he quits himself just fine on the song. I think it's okay. Uh, But frankly, it's a really big look for Post Malone to have Beyonce invite him onto her album. Post, you know, he can tour just fine, but he has actually had a big hit himself, you know, since circles you know apologies to the doja cat song that was a hit because of doja not post so big look for uh for for uh, post there yeah i'd be happy for the guy at this point i think is where the album starts to kind of drag a bit but i thought track 20 yaya super upbeat super funky a big you know f- breath of fresh air once again as like a stark 
new sound on this already very vast album. I thought Tyrant with Dolly sounded pretty solid. Amen, good closer. It's an album, not just because of its length, but because of its uh, variety. You know, there's a lot of vocal variety from Beyonce, but also inspiration variety, right? There's, there's vast samples. Beyonce, of course, spares no expense with her album budgets, bringing in all kinds of collaborators, both via samples and just the straight up live instrumentation. It's so intricate and, and detailed, you know, with the full band action you got here. There's just a lot to listen to. Beyonce, I think, just comes across as so comfortable, so in command of what she's up to these days by making these like genre albums. And if you think about the last, you know, 10 years of Beyonce music, more or less, since the self-titled album, Into Lemonade, Renaissance, and now Cowboy Carter, she's never been more engaging musically, more interesting than she is right now. It's very impressive. Again, like I said at the beginning, aging like a fine wine. But frankly, I think she's kind of peerless in terms of how she's able to operate at such scale, at such maximalist pop, right? But then she's like, you know what? I'm making the Beyonce country album. I'm not making a country album. I'm making a Beyonce country album. It doesn't compromise anything about her. She just kind of flexes on us, being like, hey, I can do all these genres too. And just because I wasn't welcomed when I performed Daddy Lessons at the CMAs back in 2016 with the chicks, I don't care. I'll just show you again why you should have uh, been a bit more kind in the first time around. And it's cool that you got some of that chart recognition officially, you know, country, Nashville, Big Tent Nashville is very closed off music industry, very wary of outsiders, you know, despite the fact that Beyonce is from the South after all. Nonetheless, it's a triumph. And I mean, again, I'm not a country guy, you know, I don't listen to folk. I don't listen to Americana. Again, she speaks to Beyonce, though. She's able to give you so much more than just the genre trappings. And that's what it means to be a Beyonce album. So Yeah, over the moon for this again. I I think Renaissance is a lot stronger, but that was more towards my personal taste. But song like Bodyguard, song like Two Most Wanted, major highlights for sure. To me, Bodyguard's the best song I've heard this year thus far through the first quarter. So we'll see if that holds. But please let me know, what did you think about Cowboy Carter? There's a lot to listen to. I'm sure there's a wide range of opinion, wide range of favorite song, etc. But please let me know what you thought of it. And for more music reviews, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. All right, that's going to do it for the pod this week. Next week, we got a lot of good stuff to talk about. The end of Tokyo Vice Season 2 over on Max. Probably the last season, unfortunately. Got a lot to talk about there. Monkey Man, Dev Patel's hand-to-hand combat action film. Very exciting. New music from Vampire Weekend and Bryson Tiller and Glorilla. Oh, and Alice Garland's Civil War. Going to see that early. Talk about that early. Can't wait. So make sure you subscribe youtube.com slash nostalgia pod linktree.com slash nostalgia pod see the links below get the spotify playlist also linked below let me know it's good and i'll see you next week